International Tax and Investment Center, and the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy. My name is Caroline Rose, a senior analyst and the head of the Power Vacuums program at the New Lines Institute for Policy and Strategy. We have four excellent guests today to share their insights and expertise on Kazakhstan's evolving security landscape, political reforms, and foreign policy posture. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Akan Rakhmatulin. Uh, Mr. Rakhmatulin serves as the first Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Republic of Kazakhstan. Formerly, he served as the Ambassador of the Republic of Kazakhstan to Pakistan, Director of the Department for, of Multilateral Co Cooperation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Republic of Kazakhstan to the United Nations, Minister Counselor and Deputy Permanent Representative of Kazakhstan to the OSCE in Vienna, and First Secretary at the Permanent Mission of Kazakhstan to the United Nations in New York. We are so joyed to have him here with us today. We're also joined by Mr. Daniel Witt, President of the International Tax and Investment Center, where he works to promote free markets and helping to lower the barriers to tax, trade, and investment in, trans in transition economies for over 30 years. Mr. Witt is the co-founder of the Arab Regional Tax Forum, Asia-Pacific Tax Forum, Eur Eurasia Fiscal Experts Seminar, and the Africa Tax Forum. Mr. Witt also serves as Vice Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Eurasia Foundation and is a founding member of the Editorial Advisory Board of the BRI Tax Journal. Next, we have Dr. Ariel Cohen, a Director of the Energy, Growth, and Security Program at the International Tax and Investment Center and a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. Dr. Cohen is the founding principal of International Market Analysis, LTD, a boutique political risk advisory. He's also the author of six books and monographs, including Russian Imperialism, Development and Crisis, and over a thousand articles on geopolitical developments in Russia and Eurasia and international energy policy. Finally, we have Dr. Kamran Bukhari, the Director of Analytical Development at the New Lines Institute and National Security and Foreign Policy Specialist at the University of Ottawa's Professional Development Institute, where he specializes in geopolitical and intelligence analysis of the Middle East, South Asia, and Central Asia. He has 15 years of experience in the private sector, intelligence space, during which he provided intellectual leadership in the publishing of cutting edge geopolitical analysis and forecasts. So first, I would like to, of course, give the floor to Mr. Witt, um, who, of course, has extensive experience working with Kazakhstan and furthering U.S.-Kazakh relations. And then we will we will get to questions. So, Mr. Witt, you well, Caroline, would, would it we want to turn to the minister before me? I I don't want to mess things up, but I. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we, we will first uh, we will first turn to um, Minister uh, Rafaktulin first for remarks and then we'll go to Mr. Witt. Thanks. Thank you very much again. And again, good morning, everyone. And very good to see my old friends, Daniel and Ariel. And uh, like me, nice meeting you, Caroline and Dr. Buhari. And uh, thank you for organizing this very important event. It's a real pleasure for me, for my colleagues. I have uh, chair of the International Information Committee, Mr. Askar Abdelkhanov, and head of uh, United States uh, Division, uh, Mr. Anwar. Uh, Kalkamanov. Uh, this year started, as you know, this is a shocking for us event that radically affected not only Kazakhstan internal priorities, but also the international agenda, regional and international agenda. And our country experienced the worst violence in its 30 years of an independent development. Yet, despite the seriously difficult situation, Kazakhstan managed to navigate the challenges and I believe come out stronger than ever before. Today, I'd like to share with you the vision of a new Kazakhstan proposed by President Tokayev aimed at the renewal and modernization of our country following the tragic event last January. On March 16th, President Tokayev delivered what some called a historic state of the nation address entitled New Kazakhstan, the path of renewal and modernization. In it, he proposed a number of far reaching reforms that would genuinely alter our political system by transitioning from a super presidential form of government to a presidential republic with a strong parliament. It was even labeled informally a second republic. 
uh, so we can feel the you know how deep we uh, take all these uh, changes to understand the dynamics of the political changes in Kazakhstan one cannot ignore the January event that took place in Almaty and many other regions of Kazakhstan tragically 232 of our compatriots including 19 law enforcement personnel died during the riots as a result of violent criminal actions of radicals and terrorists including attacks on police military administrative and commercial buildings initially about 2000 people were detained for various offenses and then president takayev instructed the prosecutor general's office to determine the degree of their guilt the uh, the level of their involvement and if there were no aggravative uh, circumstances uh, circumstances um, to mitigate the punishment of, de of detainees and as a result many citizens were released with the warning on and fines without any in jailing uh, or uh, having them in con confinement in addition the human rights commissioner and other independent public commissions led by re respected lawyers worked closely with the prosecutor general's office to prevent and report all cases of abuse from law enforcement personnel while dealing with detainees for the time being we are waiting for the results of the investigation by the interagency investigative group coordinated by the general prosecutor's office which will show a clear picture of what happened and why the situation occurred in our peaceful country and i would like to inform you that um, uh, as a result of, uh, as an outcome of uh, some part, the pre preliminary investigation, we have a number uh, accused uh, personnel from law enforcement agencies, which are now uh, uh, arrested, detained, and their cases are brought to the court for the further trial. And uh, we will try our best to make all these trials open for public. However, at this stage, we believe that the main reason for why the criminal took such cruel action is that some influential people were against the far-reaching transformations and modernization of Kazakhstan that has been taking place over the past three years. During these tragic days, our nation demonstrated unity and solidarity in their aspiration to overcome any challenges they faced, we faced actually. In this regard, the following events, following the event, our president vote to build vowed to build a new Kazakhstan. This means a more resilient, diversified and equal economy that ensures inclusiveness, wider opportunities for all citizens, a fairer society and more vibrant, dynamic and competitive political system. Protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms are also at the core of President Takayev's domestic political agenda. I would like to note that since his election as head of state in 2019, our president has put forward four packages of comprehensive political reforms, which among others include simplifying the registration procedure for political parties, decriminalization of defamation, ensuring empowerment of women, promoting religious freedoms and upholding the rights to peaceful assembly. We have completely abolished the death penalty in Kazakhstan during the second optional protocol. Having already built a strong foundation for political transformation, of the country, President, President Takayev outlined a program of sweeping political reforms and initiatives in his address to the nation in March to further transform and modernize the country. To fill the scale of reforms, I should say that they will require about 30 amendments to the Constitution and adoption of more than 20 laws before the end of this year. This year. Let me briefly go through the main initiatives our President uh, put forward. As I mentioned, first and foremost, the president's main goal is the trans transition from a super presidential form of uh, power to a presidential republic with a strong parliament in order to ensure checks and balances and to contribute to the sustainable development in the country. The new requirement will be that president is, supported, is su supposed to suspend his or her membership in any political party for the whole term uh, being in office. This will increase political competition and provide equal condition for the development of all parties and diminish any kind of administrative resource to influence the process, political process. Moreover, the governors and mayors of different districts and their deputies will prohibit it from holding positions in any party also. The legal ban for the closest relatives of the president to take 
position of top level civil serv servants and managers in the quasi public sector will be also introduced. Another measure is to increase the autonomy of the local governors and mayors. For example, currently, uh, president has the right to dismiss district and rural mayors. Such legal provisions will be abolished. The appointment of governors will be done following the selection by the local assemblies from among two or more candidates proposed by the president. Procedures for registering political parties will be significantly simplified. The registration uh, threshold will be reduced from 20,000 to 5,000 members, and for regional, regional branches from 600 to 200 people only. Rights and obligations of observers of electoral legislation will also be clearly defined and expanded. Furthermore, a constitutional court will be established. The Prosecutor General and the Commissioner for Human Rights will also be given the right to appeal to this court in addition to the president and the parliament. The quota for presidential appointees in the Senate will be reduced from 15 to 10 members. And through those appointees, more voice will be given to social groups that are underrepresented in the parliament. Those include at least five senators from among the members of the Assembly of, Pe of the People of Kazakhstan, a constitutional advisory body to president that promotes interests of more than 100 ethnic communities living in our country. Therefore, the quota of the Assembly of the uh, People of Kazakhstan in the Majlis, uh, that I meant uh, the quota will be uh, introduced for the Senate, for the upper, upper uh, chamber. And uh, in Majlis, the, uh, this quota of the Assembly of the People of Kazakhstan will be revoked. This will make the House elected in its totality by di direct voting of citizens. Another change is that if the constitutional changes are supported by the Parliament, the Senate will have the right to only approve or reject the laws already adopted by the Majlis. Consequently, the Majlis, the directly elected chamber, will be vested with the right to pass the laws. And the Senate's objection can be overcome by a qualified majority of at least two thirds of the Majlis uh, members. In yet another change, the Supreme Account Chamber will be created instead of Accounts Committee for control over the execution of the national budget. And it will report to the Majlis twice a year. And that will increase the transparency in budgeting process in our country. The important change in electoral system will be the following. And I would say it's one of the most important changes. 70% of uh, MPs will be elected on a proportional, proportional basis, while 30% will be elected on the majoritarian basis. In addition, a mixed 50-50% model will be introduced in the election of Maslihats, the local representative bodies of regions and cities of national significance, while in districts it will be based completely on the majoritarian principle. This will pave the way for individuals, non-party candidates to run for a seat in the parliament, which has not been possible since 2007, and increase both political competition and the citizens' direct engagement with the elected members of parliament and local deputies. The president has also introduced to consider uh, toughening punishment for violence against women and children and expand categories of cases heard by jury trials beyond the most serious crimes. crimes. President Tokayev additionally stressed that the media should be more competitive and independent. Thus, the law on mass media is going to be revised to enhance the conditions for the development of free media. It should be noted that Article 158 of the Criminal Code of Kazakhstan provides for criminal liability for obstructing the legitimate professional uh, activities of journalists. The state ensures the observance of the right of every citizen to freely express his or her opinion through various platforms, including the media and social networks. The recent measures taken by President Takayev clearly demonstrates this approach. Overall, President Takayev's aim is to cons consolidate public trust in our democratic process and governance. That's why he initiated the listening state concept, a pledge to further ensure inclusiveness, transparency, and continuous engagement between state and all civil society. For instance, the new law and peaceful assemblies of 2020 introduced a notification system that replaced a permissive one. Now it's enough to simply notify the authorities to hold rallies. I'll give you an example. 
uh, of this statistic, how it changed the political uh, life. Before adopting this law, there were about 10 meetings a year at most before the adoption of the law. And following the entering the law in the, into the force between June uh, 2020 and June 2021, despite the COVID pandemics, there were uh, 552 peaceful assemblies across the country utilizing the notification procedure. So you see how it changed the, the matter, the pattern of uh, this, uh, uh, of people, how people can get, gather, gather. I'd also like to add that we welcome greater involvement in NGOs and civil society activists in the implementation of reforms. We are developing public councils under the uh, central and local executive government bodies, as well as in the quasi-public sector. In this regard, the reforms announced in the March 16 address were created with the active participation of Kazakh experts, relevant state bodies and public activists. I would like to say that President Tokayev has initiated reforms not for cosmetic changes and not as a result of the January event, as many may think, but for the effective strategic development of the whole country planned well in advance. This is not a situational decision. It's a logic, logical continuation of the present previous reforms. They form a part of the overall trend and long-term course towards the all-round modernization of the country. While many of the reforms are politically focused, I would like to note that in the sphere of economy, the president's reform agenda also includes measures aimed at the de oligopolization and demonopolization of the Kazakh economy, the repatriation of the stolen Kazakhstan funds and assets from abroad. The government has also been tasked with increasing the purchasing power of the population and reducing poverty. Furthermore, more investments were made will be made in the rural regions of Kazakhstan, including in health and educational spheres. It's also worth, worth mentioning uh, the creation of people of, uh, for the People of Kazakhstan Fund. It was established to address the most pressing and acute issues uh, of the uh, citizens. Large scale national businesses and private citizens are contributed to the fund. I would like to say that only Kazakh citizens and Kazakh businesses uh, will be used to, for charity purposes, like funding treatment and purchasing expensive medicine for children who, who face rare and complicated diseases. I would like also to mention that uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, we received and we welcome here the U.S. Under Secretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy, Democracy and Human Rights, Ms. Uza Zeyer, to discuss relevant issues of our bilateral relations including development of civil society, religious freedoms, empowerment of women, combating human trafficking and corruption, consolidating the independence of the judiciary system and uh, integration, uh, close integration of people with disabilities. And we appreciate the United States support for President Takayev political reform she expressed on her behalf of on behalf of the State Department and readiness of the United States to provide maximum assistance to modernize our country. Uh, in conclusion, uh, dear friends, I would like to uh, once again uh, underline that Kazakhstan is only at the beginning of its journey uh, to the transformation of its society and modernization of its political system. Building a new Kazakhstan will not happen overnight. It took, for example, centuries for Western democracies to become a democracy. And it is a deep and long process of a social transformation. Nevertheless, our president and our nation are determined to implement these reforms fully and thoroughly in a speedy manner. I thank you very much. I, uh, uh, I can remain here for 10 minutes more because I have uh, other engagement. So I am fully at your disposal for any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Deputy Minister Rafak Tulin. Uh, I really do appreciate that. Um, we will keep our, our questions uh, open, of course, from, from audience members. I also understand that Mr. Witt has some remarks as well to make. Um, so, Mr. Witt, you have the floor. And then Thank you. The Thank you, Caroline. Uh, Mr. Minister, that was a, a great um, travel tour of the very ambitious and very, very real reforms of President Takayev. And I like the way you, re you, you stated that this is a journey um, and you've, you're developing a roadmap. 
I mean, you're not going to get there overnight. I think it's important that you continue to send that message to your people that you're committed to travel on this path, but to do it right and to do it in a way that's that's fair and reasonable and sensible and enduring will take some time. And and these, I'm an economist. So on the political issues today, um, it, you know, the title here, Kazakhstan's political reforms against regional turbulence. Um, my colleagues will talk to the political. I'm going to talk about the fiscal element because the the obscure, boring topic of intergovernmental fiscal relations, how you share money from the center to the regions to the local levels, that is at the heart of any reforms. And, and frankly, that's why it's so challenging, because it gets into political reforms, budget reforms, um, fiscal you know, tax, how do you share? And of course, there are constitutional issues. So it cuts across. And it, or just let me share a story or two, because I want everyone to know that these are issues that have been considered and understood by the Kazakhs for many, many years. Um, here is a book that ITIC started working on in 1994. We presented it to the Kazakhs in 1996. It's got, um, you know, the, the best-selling title, Fiscal Transition in Kazakhstan. And it was financed by the Asian Development Bank. And the genesis for this is I was invited to a meeting with Vice President Asin Bayev. I think only the veterans will remember him. He's sadly now deceased. He went on to be ambassador to Germany. This was in the, um, the presidential complex in Almaty in 1994. And he asked us to help with two things. Can we help with tax reform? And can we help with rebalancing the relations between the center and the sub centers? We succeeded on the tax reform. But the political intertwining of the system on fiscal federalism um, never um, took off. Um, but the vice president saw it. He said they wanted to balance the responsibility and the accountability with resources. You know, he wanted to see changes that would be good for the budget because he said that would be good for society and this was the vice president's quote. And I remember it after all those years. Not every aspect of citizens' lives should be controlled by the center. And we've seen many reforms. I mean, President Takayev's address fully, fully laid it out what needs to be done. And, and I urge my colleagues in, in Kazakhstan, it, you, you cannot have an enjoyable drink out of a fire hose. You need to take it in sips. So you need to put together a step-by-step -step plan. And sequencing is important. And, and I pledge ITIC's help and to bring in some other experts. Um, but you've had steps. Of course, the full steps were laid out by the president. But if we go back to President Nazarbayev in 2015 with his 100 concrete steps, step number 98, to introduce an independent budget of local self-governed at the level of city and lower. So it's been done. And then of course, in, in 2018, there was a system where a number of taxes that were administered centrally remained locally. And, and these were personal income tax, property tax, transport taxes, and I'm not going to go into the to the to the boring minutia, but that never resulted in more than about one fifth of the revenues. And then just one other point, um, and a quote from President Takayev's most recent address. You now he he reaffirmed his commitment to increase the financial independence of the regions, and he looked at the data since twenty since 2020. Small and medium-sized enterprises, their corporate income tax payments stay in the region. Even with the difficulties with COVID, 
in the shrinking of the overall Kazakh economy, these receipts from SMEs for the local governments were up 25%. So this shows a positive correlation. You know, you want to diversify your economy. You want to have um, a, a strong investment climate. Well, let's not just have 10 people in Astana thinking about it or under Sultan. Let's mobilize the Akims to make a rich, robust investment climate throughout the country. And by having them get some skin in the game. And, you know, just one last story that kind of centralizes this. I was playing golf with a friend of mine, and he was the ambassador from Colombia. And immediately before, he was the vice president. And I said, Well, I said, um, so are you going to go back and run for president? He goes, no, the, the best job I ever had was being mayor of Bogota. I felt like I could do more for my people, more for the people as mayor. And, and I said, he said, even more so than the president. So that tells you that you want to connect Kazakhstan to your people. You want them to buy into the vision. It's their vision. You're, the government is just the vessel to deliver it. So again, the financing is at the heart of any reforms and um, in, in this, the, the path has been identified, the preliminary steps have been taken. We stand ready to help you bring this across the finish line. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Witt. Um, now let's proceed uh, to questions. Now, the first question that I have is of course, We've seen a massive transformation in Kazakhstan from a super presidential system into a republic with a strength in parliament and widespread reforms. I'm curious how Kazakhstan's foreign policy has transformed as a result of these reforms. Has its foreign policy encompassed new elements that have resulted from these reforms? And then also, of course, by the emerging crisis in Ukraine. Um, how are we seeing Kazakhstan's foreign policy evolve from here? Um, and now, of course, I, I would love to hear from, uh, you know, Dr. Bakari, Dr. Cohen, and I know, and I understand the Deputy Minister only has a few uh, more minutes left. Um, so, of course, if you would like to answer this question as well, um, you would before. So who do we start with? Uh, de the Deputy Minister, since you have limited time, um, if, if you would like to answer this question, uh, then, we can, then we can go to Dr. Cohen, then Dr. Bakari. Yes, uh, how our policy, foreign policy changed. Uh, just referring back to the words uh, and uh, statement may, uh, made by Daniel, uh, we are very much, you know, now uh, like economy trend diplomacy. We are com uh, com uh, conducting that kind of diplomacy uh, because we are in this region and we are facing an economic downturn due to the COVID, due to the uh, other turbulent situation, the crisis situation, and um, uh, attracting foreign investments is one of our main priorities. And uh, you can imagine uh, how these shocking events in January influenced and uh, may have, uh, might have, you know, uh, push away the foreign investors, current or to be foreign investors. And uh, that time our foreign policy was aimed, you know, on um, convincing all those who are already here in Kazakhstan, who are already investing, and those who are considering uh, entering uh, our economy, that uh, nothing has changed. Uh, in the country, uh, we undertook, uh, you know, stronger uh, measures, uh, more conducive measures for the foreign businesses uh, to, to be conducted in Kazakhstan. We have uh, so many, you know, uh, uh, conducive atmosphere, conducive climate for the foreign investors, be it, you know, taxation, be it uh, providing of uh, facilities, providing of land for them. It's uh, like free, uh, free land for 49 or 99 years, for example. So, and uh, our foreign policy was aimed at um, convincing them, uh, the uh, investors, and uh, uh, bringing them here. And as far as um, recent um, 
and the current situation is concerned uh, in our region. Of course, uh, we feel, uh, we don't feel easy, honestly speaking. And uh, we have to take into account, you know, all many, many different aspects. First of all, our ge geopolitical, geographical location and uh, where we stay, where we are now, whom we are working and uh, how it's, you know, my effect overall situation in the country, in the region and uh, on, on the wider scope. And I would like to refer, want to refer to uh, my, uh, one of my teachers, a prominent diplomat, uh, Ambassador Idrisov, who was also ambassador to the United States and two times ambassador to UK now, second time. And he, he, he used to say that we're not pro-Western or pro-Russian or pro uh, whoever else, we are pro-Kazakh. So we, are, we have to, you know, protect and to ensure our own national interests. And um, of course, we are now working in a much more uh, sensitive uh, environment and we have to be very careful with what we're saying, what we're doing uh, with our partners on bilateral or multilateral, you know, uh, fora, like in the United Nations and many others. And, uh, but, uh, you know, our, situ our position towards Ukraine, it was many times explained, including our president and uh, many other politicians. So no need to repeat that. The, the main thing is attaining peace and uh, stability in the region by peaceful means. I thank you. And by the way, if, uh, if, I, if when I leave, with your permission, or of course, with your excuse, Mr. Askar Abdrahmanov, the chair of the International Information Committee will remain here and he will try to also to answer your question you may have during discussion. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. And uh, I was really pleased to join today's event. And I'm really sorry that I have to leave because your event is dedicated to reforming in my country, but <laughs> I, I have to run to another place. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. And I wish you every success today and beyond, far beyond. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much, Deputy Minister. Uh, Dr. Cohen, you have the floor. Well, uh, let me uh, address the issues that I prepared, uh, not the foreign policy. I'll, I'll address the foreign policy toward the end of my remarks. The issue I was focusing on in preparation for this event is the political, uh, legal, uh, human rights, and freedom of the media reforms. I believe that this is an opportunity for Kazakhstan to catch up because for, the, for 30 years, as uh, the founding president, uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, uh, used to call it economy first, politics later. So the politics later, now its time has come. And President Tokayev uh, said that he wants to move on the political uh, as well as economic tract simultaneously. It is important because a whole generation of generation and a half grew up uh, under the independence of Kazakhstan. Uh, so the older generation uh, clearly grew up in the Soviet Union. The new generation does not have firsthand experience of the Soviet Union. For that generation, uh, both economic development and political development uh, is important. And as Kazakhstan is becoming the upper middle income country, it's still a developing market. It's an emerging market, but it's no longer a country with what it was, $2,300 uh, a year per capita income at its starting point in 1991. It is close to $10,000 a year, this is a middle income country. In middle income countries, you have the middle class. The middle class, in addition to putting bread on the table as all of us need and want, the middle class wants additional things. They want healthcare for themselves, the elderly and their children. They want education uh, and they want also to influence 
the policy of the country. I think President Tokayev understands that. And the reforms he presented on March 16th talk about these things. What is he talking about? He is talking about moving the political structure of Kazakhstan uh, to have a greater input uh, from the parliament. And the parliament will be uh, filled, people will be elected to the parliament, not from one ruling party, but from a number of parties. I think the jury is still out to what extent these parties manage, because it's a new thing for Kazakhstan. How do you manage to present your disagreement in civilized um, form, in a civilized form that uh, you will be listened to? If you are extremely negative and people perceive you as trying to destroy the whole system, uh, there will be a certain reaction. Whereas if the opposition is loyal, if it's clear they want to improve things, not to destroy things like we saw in the event in, in events in January, uh, th there'll be more receptivity uh, to the ideas uh, the opposition may present. And I think that's important. The important steps in that direction are um, what the deputy minister mentioned, uh, freedom of assembly. Uh, we saw uh, a demonstration against um, the war in Ukraine, in support of Ukraine. That was very important. Uh, there was a women's demonstration, women's demonstration, but at the same time, critics, including here in the United States, uh, mentioned that the government is still trying to um, limit to some extent who can demonstrate, what can they say, what can they cannot say. And uh, the uh, observers and the critics uh, are there both inside Kazakhstan and outside Kazakhstan, and they will monitor how uh, these, uh, shall we call them human rights uh, items uh, in the reform package um, are implemented. Uh, in addition, as a former lawyer, uh, lapsed lawyer, as I call myself, uh, I'm very interested in the reform of courts and in measures that are taken uh, to improve the rule of law. This is also very important when we think about this transition of um, the upper income developing, upper middle income developing country to developed country, because that transition requires investment and investment re requires a transparent, competent and functioning legal system. Some of these steps have been already taken in the proposed reforms, such as the creation of the Constitutional Court. Constitutional Court is important because it will adjudicate very basic and important aspects of the political structure of Kazakhstan. It will be extremely important, number one, that people who are nominated to this court uh, will be competent, uh, will be aware of what's going on, uh, not only in Kazakhstan and in the Russian language uh, legal uh, sphere. Uh, some of the countries in the Russian language legal sphere, uh, in terms of the development of the constitutional law, didn't just advance, they uh, reversed the um, progress they had. I'm not talking about Kazakhstan now but they re reversed uh, in terms of the progress they achieved, let's say 20 years ago, uh, and now became more authoritarian. Uh, and also it is important that the constitutional court will be truly independent, that it's not just an appointment um, that um, uh, the appointment that uh, the president um, uh, executes, but beyond that appointment, those judges or justices of the constitutional court are truly independent. There's a live appointments as a rule, uh, and they take into account the balance of power and the basic and fundamental freedoms uh, that the country needs 
in order to progress. Uh, so that is also very important. Another um, key issue that um, the deputy minister mentioned, and that is an important part uh, in the um, um, presidential reform package, is that the members of the Majlis are elected in uh, provinces uh, and they have districts in which their voters know them, can communicate with them, and if they have grievances, uh, they can come to their members of parliament and complain. Again, in view of the events of January, the channels of communication between ordinary people and the government have to be open. And also remember, one of the grievances in January was the uh, price of uh, fuel that went up, uh, li uh, liquefied gas uh, that the, they use to fuel cars or to cook. And uh, people just exploded first in um, peaceful protests and then in armed protests. Um, in order to have the channels open, you have to have freedom of expression in the media, in social media, uh, in the political process. And I mentioned these regional elections so people can go and see their representative face to face. This is why I am personally a great supporter of uh, one uh, region or one district, one representative system as opposed, as opposed to the party lists that uh, used to be in Kazakhstan until now. Um, so the parliamentary um, channel uh, in which more parties um, are represented to establish a party and register it requires 5,000 uh, signatures, not 100,000 as it used to be, but also um, the freedom of people to protest and to uh, publish their opinions, uh, be it on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or other social media, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I noticed uh, in President Tokayev's Twitter feed, there were negative or critical opinions that were not removed, uh, including uh, on uh, major events such as the war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, I think the war uh, is a very serious test uh, of not just Kazakhstan, of every post-Soviet country. Um, looking at uh, public opinion, it's difficult to analyze and triangulate because on the one hand, uh, there are a lot of people who are watching uh, television from Russia and that television goes in one direction, but there's a a lot of people who are openly supportive of Ukraine. Uh, and Kazakhstan was very clear in a number of statements by President Tokayev, uh, by uh, deputy ministers, uh, by the deputy chief of the presidential administration that Kazakhstan uh, re recognizes the international norms. Uh, Kazakhstan does not recognize independence, self-proclaimed independence, of Donetsk, Luhansk, Transnistria, and others. I don't think Kazakhstan recognizes uh, the proclaimed um, secession and independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. I may be wrong. Please correct me, colleagues. Uh, and also Kazakhstan uh, abstained uh, in the UN vote and supplied humanitarian aid to Ukraine. In that respect, I believe it's important for the US policy makers and for European policymakers to understand that the sanctions that are absolutely justifiably uh, imposed on Russia do not need to punish countries that have nothing to do with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, that includes Kazakhstan that has a lot of economic relations with Russia, that includes other countries, uh, be it in the Caucasus, be it in Central Asia, um, these are innocent bystanders that should not be uh, punished. Uh, I also would um, point out that this 
conflict in Ukraine uh, justifies uh, the multi-vector foreign policy of Kazakhstan. It lives in a very difficult neighborhood. Um, it has China and Russia as its neighbors. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, um, you see uh, what challenges the great powers present, but you also see even in the neighborhood, the recent shootings between the Tajiks and the, Kyr and the um, Kyrgyz. Uh, that too needs to be taken into account. Uh, I think I should wrap up my remarks here. We have Kamran and we have Q&A. Thank you very much. And I'm going to go get a glass of water, so I'll shut my video. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohen. Uh, I remember that, you know, in January, you talked about this need to balance between climbing down on capital flight, but also, of course, making the country attractive to foreign investment. Um, and I think that we've seen this balance play out very much over the past few months. And Kamran, I'm curious how you've seen this progression. And then also, of course, uh, speaking to what Dr. Cohen talked about, the multi-vector foreign policy, some of those geopolitical effects that we've seen as a result of some of these reforms, but then also, of course, the direction that Kazakhstan is going. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you uh, to our colleagues at ITIC and His Excellency, the Deputy Minister for participating. Um, Caroline, that is uh, that is basically the question. Uh, you have a situation where uh, countries like Kazakhstan that want to engage in political economic reform that have come uh, a long way since their independence and they want to focus inwards. The last thing they want uh, are geopolitical cross currents undermining their already delicate uh, endeavor to you know, reform their political uh, system, to uh, invite investments so as to enhance uh, the economic standing of the country. Uh, all of these things are in of themselves very challenging and difficult. Now, if you add the fact that Kazakhstan is uh, perhaps one of the most geopolitically sandwiched countries in the world, uh, there is a 4,254 mile long border with Russia, that's huge. That's almost as long as the Canada-US border. Uh, to, to sort of give perspective to our listeners here in North America uh, that may not be familiar with the uh, geography of Eurasia. Uh, then you have an 1100 mile border with China. So uh, this is the strategically most sandwiched country in the, in the world uh, with two great powers, not one. And one of those great powers is now uh, engaged in a, in a, in a very, uh, if you will, horrific war in Ukraine. And, and it's, un, it's increasingly coming under sanctions. Uh, it's safe to say that the war in Ukraine has placed Russia into huge uncertainty. It's, you know, what will become of Russia? How will it behave internally? How will it behave on the foreign policy front? Uh, these things matter to Kazakhstan because not only because of geography, but also because of demography. As many as 20% of all Kazakh citizens are ethnically Russian. That's a huge cross-section of society that uh, you know, Kazakhstan's leadership has to take into uh, consideration. And Kazakhstan is currently trying to walk that fine line. Um, many of my co-panelists have mentioned you know, the multi-vector foreign policy. I think that uh, this, this signature approach of, of the Kazakhs uh, of having you know, relationships as diverse uh, as those with China, the United States, Europe, and Russia are under test. In other words, that whole doctrine of multi-vector foreign policy is coming under a test and it will be challenged because uh, on one hand, uh, the Kazakhs need international investment to further their political economic reforms. On the other hand, they cannot ignore what is happening, uh, you know, with uh, with Russia, uh, which has been, you know, a, a, a uh, past colonial power and continues to remain uh, a, a great power. Uh, at the same time, uh, China is observing all these changes that are taking place uh, with regards to Russia 
uh, and the Russian war in Ukraine. Uh, the Chinese will undoubtedly want to be able to uh, take advantage of that situation and further their interests in Central Asia. And because of the long border that they have with, with, with Kazakhstan and their BRI uh, uh, infrastructure that they've been building uh, over the years, since at least 2013, uh, all of that becomes even more important uh, in terms of what Russia will do. I had a piece uh, back in 2019 in which uh, I basically argued that the, uh, you know, the, the Russia's has a receding footprint in Central Asia and China is going to try and fill that vacuum. Well, that process just got accelerated because of the war uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. Now, obviously, uh, the, uh, the political economic reforms that Kazakhstan is undertaking will require a lot of cooperation from the West, particularly the United States. And, uh, you know, Kazakhstan, the last thing Kazakhstan wants is over focus on, uh, you know, the conflict in, in Ukraine because it distracts from its needs. Uh, you know, these things uh, do not, you know, uh, are not neatly aligned with respect to time. Uh, at the, when uh, Kazakhstan was going, undergoing unrest in the early weeks of January, uh, nobody knew that Russia, although there, there was the buildup, but nobody really knew that Russia would engage in such a large scale military intervention in Ukraine. Uh, certainly the Kazakhs were not looking at that. And therefore now the question is, uh, how much bandwidth does the West, the United States and Europe have uh, in terms of being able to pay attention to the needs of Kazakhstan? So there are two parts to this. One is to uh, not in the in the in these international effort to isolate Russia, you have to be careful how it impacts. As Ariel was saying, there are bystander countries that have nothing to do with the Ukraine conflict, but they are tethered. Uh, in the, uh, the, uh, uh, they're tethered in their relationship with Russia. How do you isolate Russia and not hurt a country like Kazakhstan? And there are other countries, as Ariel was mentioning, uh, where. You know, in the last few days, we've seen a lot of uproar between India and the United States because the Indians, as you know, they're out there in South Asia uh, at the other end of the the the, uh, the Eurasian landmass, but they're being affected by this as well. So then, imagine how Kazakhstan is being affected. So I think that there's a need for the United States and its allies uh, to sort of figure this out. It's not. It's going. It's going to be hard because there is the imperative to isolate Russia and prevent it from doing more damage to Ukraine. But in the process, we don't want to undermine the positions of uh, our Kazakh allies and those who are around the region. Um, and this isn't the only worry for Kazakhstan. You know, there are others, and I, I know time is running out, so I'll quickly run through the, the list. Uh, you know, it was just six months ago when uh, Afghanistan was taken over by the Taliban. And, and Kazakhstan's, uh, you know, uh, focus was diverted to, to its southern flank on, on how this new regime in Afghanistan is going to uh, impact stability and security in Central Asia. And, and being the largest country of the region, uh, Kazakhstan uh, is, is obviously very, very concerned. Uh, meanwhile, you know, you, you, you have the situation to the west of, you know, the western flank of Kazakhstan and the northern uh, with regards to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. In the south, you have the instability that's radiating out of Afghanistan, or at least the uncertainty. Uh, but there's also something that's naturally occurring. Uh, Uzbekistan, which is the largest population uh, in the region, is also going through a uh, delicate but natural political economic transformation. And it, it, that's something that has to be factored in by the Kazakh uh, leadership in terms of how that could impact what the Kazakhs are trying to achieve at home. We just saw a couple of weeks ago, uh, a new leadership emerge in Turkmenistan. And so there's a lot that's happening in the region, even if we do not take into consideration, uh, you know, great power competition uh, whether it's, you know, the U.S. effort to contain Russia or China, there's a lot happening in the region. 
And I haven't mentioned, and, and you know, time pro prohibits us, the, the lack of time prohibits us from going into details. Turkey is emerging as a player uh, in this environment as well. Iran is being rehabilitated uh, but through the JCPOA version 2.0, whenever that takes place. So there are a lot of factors here that the Kazakhs will have to take into consideration as they push ahead uh, in their endeavor for political economic reforms at home. So I'll just stop right there and then we can go to Q&A. Thank you. Cameron, let me just jump in on a key point. You talked about the natural reforms that are underway in Uzbekistan. Um, too early to tell on Turkmenistan, but I think many of these reforms that have been showcased by President Takayev are organic and naturally developing in Kazakhstan. And, and I urge my friends in the US government as part of your rationale for differentiating this region from Russia and the, the other problem parts of the broader Eurasia, you know, look at the look at the actions. I mean, it's much more than free speech, freedom to protest, you know, on uncensored social media. But we're talking about a real shift of power from the center to the subnational units, um, granting more autonomy to local governments through fiscal, functional, and political decentralization. This is the exact opposite that big neighbor in the North is doing. And these are real steps, not just words. And I think they deserve recognition and support by whatever appropriate means from the United States, because that will fuel further like-minded reforms throughout the entire Central Asia region. Well, thank you so much to our panelists. In the interest of time, unfortunately, uh, we won't be able to get to audience uh, questions. Uh, but that said, I just want to thank you all very much for an insightful conversation on the future of Kazakhstan's political reforms, its economic posture, its security landscape, and of course, its foreign policy. And we greatly thank our guests for joining us today um, from around the world uh, to answer these questions and provide such uh, in insightful answers. I would also like to invite our audience to join us for an event on Monday, April 18th from 11.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Uh, at the Kazakh embassy and virtually, and it's, it's called Kazakhstan's Investments Future Despite Russian Sanctions, a discussion with senior officials. We are joined by a plethora of very interesting, very insightful guests. Uh, for example, the first deputy chief of staff of the president of Kazakhstan, the minister of national economy is of Kazakhstan, the chairman for agency of strategic planning and reforms of Kazakhstan, the governor, the governor of the National Bank of Kazakhstan, and the governor of the Astana International Financial Center. And then of course, our guests from ITIC and New Lines. Uh, we would love it if you could join us. Uh, thank you so much for joining for our virtual audience members. Uh, please keep in touch with us at ITIC and the New Lines Institute for future events and projects on Kazakhstan and the Central Asia region. You can check out our analyses and our work at ITICnet.org and newlinesinstitute.org. I hope you all have a lovely day. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to get more content like this.